and welcome to the Caroline Cymru revision sessions. The session this evening will focus on Punnett squares at GCSE level and will be presented by Abigail Cavanagh from Connors Key High School. The session will last around 45 minutes where Mrs Cavanagh will run through the relevant content. If you have any questions during the session, please use the question and answer Q&A section and we'll do our best to answer you. You will see that there's a hyperlink in the Q&A section. If you're happy to leave your name and email address, we would love to keep in touch with you so that we can send you information about future events. You can click on the link at any time during the session. Today's session will be recorded and the recording and any relevant resources will be uploaded to the AirScall website under the Carolam Cymru tab. Thank you, Mrs Kavanagh. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this GCSE revision session. This is the third of our four sessions and in this session, we're going to have a look at Punnett Squares, which is part of the Year 11 GCSE for Biology. So we're going to have a look in this session at how we should complete a genetic cross, and we're going to look at the stages involved in that, and we're going to look at how we predict and identify the outcomes of genetic crosses, as well as using some key terms that we need to be familiar with to describe what's going on in our genetic crosses. OK, so at the end, then you'll be able to describe the stages involved in carrying out a genetic cross. You'll be able to predict and identify these outcomes and then use the key terms as we go through. So what I've done, I've got some example questions as well to have a go at, and we will use the key terms as we go through to make sure that you are getting more and more familiar with these key terms, because this is one of the areas I think in GCSE biology where there are a lot of key terms that you need to be familiar with. And it's not just you being familiar with them, it's that they might appear in a question, so you will need to know the meaning of these terms. OK, so here are some of these keywords that you should be familiar with if you've been studying this particular section of GCSE biology. So let's have a look at them and then we'll have a go at giving them some definitions when we look and move on to the next slide. So we've got an allele, we've got genotype and phenotype, we've got homozygous and that can be two different versions. So we can have homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. We've also got heterozygous, chromosome, DNA and gene. So let's look at these terms in a little bit more detail. So what you need to think about is a way that you can learn these key definitions because they are going to be used again and again, whether it's you need to give the definition, give the meaning of some of these words or whether you need to be able to interpret what they mean when they are in a question. So an allele is different versions of the same gene. And if we look at gene, that is the basic unit of genetic material that we inherit from our parents. So it's a section of DNA. And it's very important in G, the gene is in terms of making new proteins and also determining our appearance. So gene and allele are very important. So, for example, in our body, we might have a gene that codes for brown hair or hair colour. And the different versions of that gene, which are the alleles, for example, might be brown hair and black hair. OK, so it's just making sure that you know what these terms are and also examples of when you might use them. So moving on, we've got the genotype and the phenotype, which are two quite similar words, but we need to make sure that we remember the difference between them. So the genotype refers to the alleles that an organism has and they are written as letters. So it could be, for example, a big B and a little b. And the phenotype is the physical, visible characteristics of an organism. So it's its appearance, really. It's, it's the outward expression of those genes, so what those genes look like. Homozygous and heterozygous, as we mentioned earlier, so homozygous can be either dominant or recessive. And homozygous has two alleles that are identical. So for homozygous dominant, you would have two capital letters. And for homozygous recessive, 
you would have two lowercase letters. The chromosome is um, part of, of the DNA that codes for the characteristics of an organism and DNA. And we've looked at the structure of DNA in other sessions and we'll just recap that tonight as well. Um, and that carries all of our genetic information that enables us um, to develop as a human being. And finally, just looking at dominant and recessive. So dominant is aligned with the homozygous aspect and we have two capital letters there to say something is homozygous dominant or if it is a heterozygous situation it would just be called heterozygous heterozygous doesn't have dominant or recessive after it so it is just heterozygous and in that case it might have one capital letter and one lowercase letter and then the dominant allele there is the one that is seen in the recessive allele, the lowercase letter, is not expressed in, in that organism. And then finally, recessive, that's where we have um, two lowercase letters. And in that case, you have to have a lowercase from both parents in terms of a recessive gene. And that is how that person then inherits a particular illness. And we'll look at some examples of this as we go through this session. OK, so as I mentioned, then we'll we'll recap and look at this particular um, area that, that you should be familiar with. And there's a diagram here of the sugar phosphate backbone and a basis, so the DNA double helix that's been opened out. And you should be familiar with this. You should, let's just get my highlighter, Here we are, hopefully. OK, so you should remember that this part here. Is called the sugar phosphate backbone. And there are two either side of the of the coiled DNA. And then what I want you to think about is this middle part here. Which are our four bases. So pause the film here. If you are doing higher. You need to know the full name of these bases, so thymine, adenine, guanine and cytosine. If you're doing foundation, you need to know the letters, so A, T, C and G. But you also need to remember which one matches with which one. So pause the film for a second or two and write down your answers and then we'll go through them. OK, so what we should have then is T joins with A or thymine joins with adenine. Adenine joins with thymine on that part of the base pairs. And then for C, we've got guanine or G. And then cytosine there. OK. So here are some features, another little revision activity here that are either inherited or not inherited. So I want you to pause the film here and write down which ones you think are inherited and which ones are not inherited. OK, let's have a look. So we've got seven different things here, situations, and we need to just think which ones are inherited and which ones are not inherited. OK, so eye colour and nose shape, dimples and cystic fibrosis and our natural hair colour are all features that are inherited and then not inherited is having your ears pierced or dyeing your hair. They are environmental things that might change during our lifetime. OK, and then just to recap again of some of our key definitions before we move on and build on this. So we've got allele, genotype and phenotype, and then homozygous and heterozygous. OK, so allele, we're linking here to the type of gene, so it's different versions of a gene. 
The genotype is the genetic makeup of an individual for a particular characteristic. So that genetic information and the phenotype is the physical expression. So what that person might look like. Homozygous is when we have both versions of the gene the same. So two capital letters that would be called homozygous dominant in that situation. And then heterozygous at the top. Both genes are different. So we would have two different versions of the allele there, big B and little b. Okay, now this is a link to a film, so hopefully this will work here. Um, and it's on BBC Bite Size, so hopefully this will work and enable us to watch it for a couple of minutes. And it just explains very nicely the idea of Punnett squares. OK, so that sums up really nicely. What we. Want to know, really, so let's just get back to our PowerPoint. Here we are. OK, so we should be familiar now then with some of these terms and how they are used, and I think one of the best ways to to look at them is to use them in some exam questions shortly. 
So we've got different forms of the same gene are called alleles, and that could be hair colour in different ways. And those that are always shown, always expressed, are called dominant genes. And we've got an example there that are freckles. Freckles are dominant. Recessive genes are those that will only be expressed if you have two of them. So if you don't have two and you are heterozygous, like we saw in the film or I've explained earlier, then you'd have um, one capital letter and one lowercase if you were looking at a Punnett square. And that would mean that you would carry that trait, that recessive trait gene, but you would not show that in any particular way. And the person who came up with this idea was Gregor Mendel, and he looked at inheritance many, many years ago, round about, well, he lived 1822 to 1884, and he was very thorough in his work. He worked with pea plants, he was a monk and lived in Austria, And these units of inheritance, and he didn't know what they were called then at the time, were passed on to the to offspring and they weren't altered in, a, in any way. So the problem was, though, with Gregor Mendel and his ideas, they weren't recognised at the time. He published his ideas in um, a scientific journal that not many people read. Um, and it was published, these ideas of the pea plants uh, and um, inheritance were published in 1866, but it wasn't until the 1900s really that scientists realised that Mendel's work might be more relevant and, and they, they thought about how they could use it really in terms of what we were doing at that time. He showed his um, research to other scientists, but he didn't really communicate that very well at the time and other scientists didn't really understand it and weren't very interested in what he had done. Um, the scientific journal that he published in um, was not very well read, which was a problem as well. And then he couldn't explain his ideas any further. So what he'd done, he'd looked at um, pea plants and he bred red flowers with white flowers um, from, from the peas. And when all of those peas, um, the offspring were produced, all of the plants had red flowers. So he was quite surprised about that. And then when he bred those, that second generation, another term that you need to be familiar with, when he bred that second generation together, he noticed that some were red and some were white. And this is what, what enabled him to do his work. Um, but it wasn't until later in the 19th century that we came up with the idea of chromosomes. Um, and that's because microscopes improved and we were able to do more techniques that enable that that visualization of, of these ideas to come together um, and then from that then we looked at genes and we found chromosomes and this was in the 20th century and this this leads us really to the work of um, some scientists who then in the 20th century looked at the structure of DNA which was Crick and Watson using the data that had been put forward by Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins they they then came up with this model of DNA and this then enabled us to, to realise that we had this double helix shape and then we use this model to find out how genes code for different proteins and amino acids that then make up the proteins. Okay, so let's look at this example. So this is a green parent plant and we've got some dominant and recessive alleles here. So let's just get the highlighter ready. OK, so here we've got a dominant allele. And we've got the recessive allele, the purple flowers. So in this cross, we've got two green plants. And they are both capital G. So we know that we can describe them as homozygous dominant, both plants. OK, so in this first box, we're taking this, the capital G from one and the capital G from the next to make a homozygous. So this is homozygous dominant. And out of these four 
potential offsprings here. Oh dear, sorry. We've got four capital G's. My mouse is going a bit funny here, apologies. So in this potential cross here, we've got 100% that are going to be green plants. And we've got four here that are homozygous dominant. So let's look at another example. So now this is a slightly different cross. We've got two green parent plants again, big G, little g this time. They are our letters that we are using to represent this. That's their genotype. Their phenotype is green parent plant. So in the first box, where's my pen gone? We've got a big G and a big G. Then following the line across here, we've got a big G and a little G. And again here, we've got a big G and a little g. And then finally, we have got two little g's. Now what we need to be able to do is to describe what these results show us. OK, so first of all. I'll just let that. Okay. We've got Yeah. I just want to highlight these three possible offspring in this case. So we've got a big G, big G, which is homozygous dominant. That plant will have the phenotype green. Then we've got two big G, little g, which are heterozygous. They will also be green in appearance, but they carry the trait for the purple flower. OK, so they carry that purple trait. And then finally, we've got two, sorry, two small letters. One potential offspring, which is homozygous recessive, and that will not be green in colour, that will be purple in colour. And this was one of one of the situations that Gregor Mendel put forward as being his three to one ratio. So that idea that you would have in this case, three green plants to one purple. OK, so we look at a third example. So pause the film here now and you have a go at filling in the Punnett square. OK, so we've got here a big G and a little g. Over here we've got two little g's. And then again we've got a big g, a little g, and two over here little g's. Okay so in this case we've got a 50-50 split so it's a one to one ratio if you're asked ever to do anything like that. So here, big G, little g means it's heterozygous. It will appear green, but will carry the trait for purple. And these two offspring here have two little g's, which means they both appear purple. OK, so before we look at some questions, we're just going to have a go at another type of Punnett square. So just very briefly pause the film and have a look at completing this. So what we've got here is what we would call a pure breed here with the two capital T's and again a pure breed here with the two lowercase t's and we would end up with all of the boxes being filled in with a big T and a little t. So when we start off with having two pure breeds, so we've got one homozygous dominant here with the two T's, two capital T's, and then one homozygous recessive here and here. 
here and here with the two lowercase t's. When they're bred together, all four would be big T, little t, and they would be heterozygous. So depending on what we are um, breeding here in terms of characteristics, there would be a dominant characteristic that would be expressed and the recessive characteristic would be carried but not seen. Okay. Next example. So we've got, let's go change this to a highlighter. So we've got here a big T and a little t, which is heterozygous. So the dominant characteristic would be expressed and the recessive characteristic would be carried but not seen. And then here the gametes, two lower case T's, which would be homozygous recessive. And let's have a look, pause the film, and then we'll have a look at what the potential outcome would be. And there it is. So we've got big T, little t here for 50%. And then we've got two little t's here for the other 50%. So that's a one to one ratio. The two little t's there would be called homozygous recessive. And then the big T, little t here are heterozygous. OK, so another example again, just at any point here, pause the film. And have a go at these. So we've got a big T, little t, crossed with a big T and a little t. In this case, this is a heterozygous characteristics that are going to be inherited on both parts of the Punnett square. So remember, heterozygous has a capital letter and a lowercase letter. Let's have a look. So we've got here. our typical Mendelian three to one ratio where we've got big T, big T, big T, little t, and big T, little t. So there are three and then our one here, which is recessive. So these three that I've highlighted here, so the big T's and the big T and the small t would all have the same appearance. They would all have the same phenotype but genotype would be different. And you can see that there in that example. OK, some true or false then. So if you are watching this now, just play along and, and just put T or F on your piece of paper. So chromosomes are found in the nucleus of the cell. So if you think that's true, write that down. If you think it's false, it is actually true. There are 46 pairs of chromosomes in a human cell. So again, if you think that's true, put T or F for false. It's false, there's not 46 pairs, there are 23 pairs. Next one, we only inherit features from one of our parents. So if you think we only inherit features from one of our parents, is that true or is that False. False because we inherit features from both of our parents. OK, so we're going to move on now and have a look at some practice questions. And I think this will be very useful for us to enable us to attempt some exam questions in the coming weeks and months. OK, so what we've got here. Is a question to do with flies and it's a case here of, of using that information that, that we've already looked at and using that to help us to answer these questions. So let's have a look at it and see what it's asking us to include here. So it tells us that we've got a grey bodied fly and it was mated with a black bodied fly. So that's here. All of the F1 offspring were grey bodied. OK, so what that means is that idea here, this term F1, it means the first filial generation. It means the first generation that have been produced from a cross. And there's quite a lot of information in that first sentence. So it's showing us that we've got the grey bodied fly that's been crossed with the black bodied and all of the offspring are grey bodied. Now that tells us some information there. 
have a think what that tells us. Just pause the film for a second. Have a think, what does that tell us about those offspring? And which colour is dominant over the other colour? OK, so you should have had a little think. And from that information, we can gather that the grey bodied fly is dominant over the black bodied fly. Now, it's very clearly telling us here on part A, using the letters A, so big A and little a, to represent the alleles for the two different body colours, complete the Punnett square below to show the offspring produced from the mating between the grey bodied and the black bodied flies. That's quite a long question for two marks. Now, what we've got to remember here is we've got the first generation here. So we need to think about what, what relationship really we need to use for those letters. So let's get the pen. So we need to include the gametes. Now we know it's first generation cross, so that means it's a pure cross, like we saw on some of our examples earlier. So we would want two capital A's here, and two lowercase a's as our gametes in the Punnett square. Now that would be one of your marks for this particular question. And then the second mark would be to complete the cross. So we would have a big A and a little a. And in fact, the way this particular cross is organised, then all of the boxes would show a big A and a little A. So to use some of our oops, to use some of our terms that we've been familiar with and which we've been talking about in this session. So the big A, big A would be called homozygous dominant. The big, the two small a's would be homozygous recessive. And then our outcomes here, big A, little a, would be heterozygous. And what we've done here, we've crossed the grey bodied with the black bodied, the two small lowercase a's, and our offspring are all going to appear to be grey, but they will be carrying the trait for black fly body colour. OK, so let's move on and look at our next part of this question. And again, we've got to breed those organisms that we've just used in our previous question and put them into this Punnett square table. OK, so that's why here it tells us it's the F2 generation. So that means it's the second generation. So if you remember from that question, again, this is two marks. So this is these are both two very straightforward marks here or four marks in total for these two Punnett square questions. So we'd put our gametes in and remember we've got two heterozygous flies. So they are both grey in colour with the black trait. OK, so pause the film now. Have a think. What would you fill in these particular spaces in this Punnett square? OK, so let's have a look. So we'd have a big A. And a big A. Followed by a big A. And a little A here. And a big A and a little A here. And then finally, two little a's. And this is our ratio that Mendel was very keen to promote and, and, and was part of his, his work that he'd done. So it's a three to one ratio. Now, we've got three, so we've got big A, big A, homozygous dominant. 
We've got two heterozygouses, so big A, little a, so that's our three. Now what we do need to do in this next part of the question is include what colour that is. So we've got three grey, And then our two small letter A's here, which are homozygous recessive, gives us the colour black. I'm just going to write B for now. And then finally, we need to name the 19th century scientist who worked on the pea plants that led to the understanding of this. And that person, if we remember, was Gregor Mendel. So that's quite a nice straightforward question that you can answer and interpret very easily. And this is the mark scheme, so you've got that should you wish to refer to it, but you can clearly see, so let me put the highlighter back on again, that the gametes are here, you've got the mark for the gametes being correct, you do get a mark for the mechanics of the cross, but you've got to make sure that you use the letter A when you complete this question. Similarly, for the next part, you are still following through and using that letter A to enable you to complete that particular part. And then again, three to one and Gregor Mendel. You don't have to put the full name in this case. So that's six quite straightforward marks that you could get from answering that question. So let's have a look at another example. And this is to do with cats. And it's to do with a particular type of cat that is a Manx cat that doesn't have a tail. And what we need to look at here, this was a mutation, which you may well be familiar with. It's a term that we need to make sure that we are able to use, um, which means that it's a change in the DNA or the genetic material. And this arose sometime in the 1700s or 1800s, and it produced a dominant allele that resulted in the lack of a tail. And here's the Manx cat without its tail. So here we've got another Punnett square. And first of all, we've got to describe what is meant by the term dominant allele. And then we're looking at completing the Punnett square part at the bottom. So We'll go on to the Punnett square first of all. OK, so it says the allele for no tail can be represented by the letter B. So it's asking us to use the letter B in this case. Cats that lack the B allele have normal tail lengths. The following cross two heterozygous cats are mated together. We must complete the information in the table by writing the genotype of both parents and select a suitable letter to represent the allele for a normal tail length. So we've got the phenotype of the parents here, which is already given, so we know they are both Manx cats, but we need to include the genotype for that first of all, and then complete the Punnett square. And then finally on this little part, it's asking us or there's a question really, the dominant allele, which is the letter B, is lethal in the homozygous condition. The kittens die before birth. How many kittens out of a litter of eight would be expected to survive in the above cross? OK, so pause the film now. Have a go at this question. I'm not going to go through it like I did with the other one. I'll go through it in a second. So you've got to think about here what the term dominant allele means. Then it tells us in the question that we've got a heterozygous cross. So think now back to the term, what does that mean? What does that term heterozygous mean? So you've got to write there a suitable letter to represent the alleles for a normal tail. And then complete the Punnett square. And then think about how many kittens out of the litter of eight would be expected to survive in that above cross that you've just done. So pause the film now, have a look at answering 
A and B, and then we'll have a look at the answers. OK. So here, um, our answer for dominant would be an allele which, when present in the heterozygous condition, is shown in the phenotype. So it just means that when you have a heterozygous cross, then that phenotype is always expressed. The second part was asking us for the genotypes. Um, and it tells us to use the letter B. So you need to have heterozygous because they're both Manx cats. So we need a big B and a little B there to be written. If we move on to the Punnett square, we can see we've got big B, little B crossed with big B and little B. Put that back on the highlighter here. So these are both heterozygous like, like you told us in the question. And then these are our offspring here. So we've got two big Bs, which is homozygous dominant. We've got two heterozygous, and then we've got one homozygous recessive. And then it's asking us how many cats would be affected, and it's six but we're not allowed to accept 75% because it was very clearly asking us for a number. And then if we just go back to the second part of the question, we've got to give the phenotypes and genotypes of two cats that would be mated in order to ensure their survival. So it's the phenotype, remember, which is their appearance and the genotype, which is their genetic information. So here, we would have for the phenotype a Manx cat with no tail crossed with a normal cat. And then our genotypes here would be heterozygous, big B, little b, crossed with homozygous recessive, two little b's. OK, so in this session, then we've looked at some of the stages in carrying out a genetic cross. You've been able to predict and identify some of the outcomes of genetic crosses and used those key terms throughout to describe genetic crosses. And I think that's really important, really, that the more practice you have of past paper questions, make sure that as you go through them, that you use the terms as often as you can to help you to understand and get a deeper understanding of those questions that you are answering. So thank you very much for listening tonight.